Tim, we have a general election coming up, and that could be quite disastrous for shooting, or so I have been led to believe by some of the things I've seen on social media. We've got two main parties in England, of course. There is a chance of a coalition, certainly depending on which newspaper you read will make you believe that. What party should shooters be voting for? Is it is it quite black and white? What What is the sort of scene look like currently? God, that's a... That's a... Go start off with a big question, Johnny. Um, I mean, let's get into the real stuff because that's, I mean, that's the bottom line, right? Traditionally, Labour hasn't loved shooting so much, and most shooters end up voting for the Conservatives. That seems to be the, the general consensus. Although recently, I didn't feel that was quite so the case until I saw the manifestos and promises, and it basically feels like that's the case. Put it into con context I think when you're voting, you can't vote or you shouldn't vote on a single issue. Right, that's when you get things like Brexit happen. So you, you've got to take a measured approach to all parts of your life. But you're right. Most most shooters will vote uh, right and most um, anti-shooters will vote left. And there'll be things in the middle as well. So we've had all the manifestos out now. The Labour man manifesto specifically mentions things that might affect us from from what i can see in three areas the conservative manifesto in one lib democrats is a bit more wishy-washy and the the other party that's gaining some traction is nigel farage's reform party and that doesn't really mention anything about anything in the manifesto at all to be totally honest so so i think like you said there's two main parties and it's it's labor and the conservative party um, and it, I think who to vote for is a bigger question than just about shooting. But we we can talk about what. No, I think we we're not here to give life advice or any deeper political things. I think than how will it affect shooting gun ownership in the UK? Um, yeah. If we're going to start getting into like taxation or quality of the NHS, this could be a large conversation. Yeah, it could also be like a proper podcast, and we don't want to go down that route, do we? So. Let's, let's far from it, though, far from it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this um, is quite serious enough. Yeah. So, so, should we start? Should we start with the the big things that were in the Labour manifesto that we we picked up on? It only came out very a few days ago, so we haven't actually gone had a chance to go through it tooth and nail. But um, some of, some of the points in there is the continuation of a ban on the import of hunting trophies, for example, is is one piece of uh, legislation they, they're going to continue to put through but so are the conservatives so so that piece of legislation is in is in both and i don't know what your thoughts on that particular topic are but, but i mean honestly i've question. i've never really understood because even if they don't import the trophy they can still go out and do it um <laughs> the reality is it uh, there, there's plenty of arguments out, out there for uh, against this concept because it is inherently only damaging to the countries who would otherwise benefit from that income. Uh, at the point they're importing a trophy, the animal's already died. And so I think from the very bottom line, it's a little bit silly. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a one of these sound bites that looks really good on paper and it is is one to attract voters that they may not yeah, get yeah. through taxation. So it's a bit of a nothing policy to be honest but it will affect it will affect a significant number of uk businesses and it will affect a significant number of different countries businesses right it's as you said if both parties have it the chances of it going at least up to the house of lords is is there right yeah which which's already been to the house of lords and been sent back down and they yeah, got kicked out didn't it at the end of the parliament yeah so so that's that's one that's in both manifestos that's that's quite interesting in in terms of why it's there, so I think it I think it's there to capture the capture the um, the vote of the people who I'm not really sure I, I don't really care about tax or mortgages, um, but the but sort I of do love animals. And, I do love animals. The blogs and websites I listen to might talk about that, and I think that's the reason for that particular piece going into both manifestos. Yeah, it's, it's very it, it panders to popular opinion, right? And that's are you. That's how you win an election at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 that's that's one that's relatively 
benign, but actually the consequences, like you say, the consequences on the continent of Africa, for instance, could be huge. It could be way have way more effect than is intended for a wildlife conservation, um, African uh, rural economy um, in these in these areas where hunting takes place. Um, and some UK businesses who are involved in that that sort of hunting part of the business, hunting trips abroad, abroad, taxidermists. I guess the bottom line is I can't see any positive that comes out of this. I, I can see literally zero positive that comes out of this. Uh, if we're going to start getting riled up about it, and the more I think about these things, often I become less calm. But there is no positive. Can, can you explain one? Maybe an animal won't die, but those animals, uh, things die. Animals will die. Someone will shoot it and then not import a trophy or import a trophy to a different country. I don't understand how this in any way... I appreciate it is supposed to act as a deterrent for a completely legal and justifiable activity, but the only benefit is to potentially win votes from people who don't understand the complexities of hunting or hunter-driven conservation. And that's yes. indicative yeah. of the and, and modern mindset. <laughs> yeah, and let's be honest about it. Um, candidates, parliamentary candidates, generally don't understand um, hunting conservation. They, 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 they've taken advice to get a soundbite. And it's, it's quite interesting that the, the, this was announced by Steve Reid, who currently is the Labour shadow um, Secretary of State for, for DEFRA from you know, agriculture and that sort of thing. So he announced this particular policy um, after one of the debates where Keir Starmer did particularly badly in. So it, it was the next morning wow. they announced this policy, which wasn't in the original manifesto, or wasn't picked up in the original drafts that were leaked. So I think this is a bit of a bolt on to try and get a story in some of the red tops to say those horrible hunters aren't going to be able to import their trophies. The, the, I, I find our current political system kind of well, extremely outdated and semi-deplorable in the fact that this is a popularity contest, not a how well, how best can we look after the populist contest. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's how much can yeah, we make people Ever's forget been, our Ever's past sins. Well. Yeah, but hey-ho. Um, other than that, what I mean, I've, I have read through this. What should we bring up next, agenda-wise? We could look at... Humane cable strength snares. Oh, yes. Again, nice low hanging fruit, I guess. Yeah, so this is. Outright ban. This was an. Yes. So the. the um, Again, in the same uh, TikTok or Twitter announcement that Steve Reed made about um, trophy hunting, he said that Labour intend to ban snares which is a thin wire device for killing and um, rabbits and foxes which allow them to suffer an extreme pain rabbits um, and very foxes. emotive so yeah all in any snares yeah, yeah. so very emotive rough. um very emotive words but actually what they're not to what, what i believe they're not talking about are the modern defra code compliant humane cable restraints which aren't a thin wire device used to kill fox and snares they're a they're a soft wired device used to hold a fox they're, they're no different to a cage trap so are they potentially I using that, that wording so that they don't have to they're not going to ban all humane cable restraints they are essentially making illegal snares illegal which they already are potentially and 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 that would be the conversations that I will we will have with the new Secretary of State for DEFRA when there is one when there's the election is finished so the difficulty right now Johnny is there are no MPs so, so there's nobody the, to talk to about any of these things there's no one to talk to there's no one to talk to and and in reality there's just candidates at the makeup, who don't have to stand by their word yeah Okay. Yeah, well, they should, they should do, but they don't have to. But that's down to us as as um, citizens to call them to account. Now, the, the the makeup of let's say Labour get in, which the polls are predicting at the minute a landslide victory, the makeup of the shadow part, the shadow cabinet as was, 
I don't think will be the same as the cabinet if Labour get in, because they've got quite a lot of big hitters who didn't have seats last time, who will potentially get mm -hmm. back into Parliament, and they'll have to find places for these big hitters to go. So, for example, the current Shadow Secretary of State, uh, Steve Reid, his his political career started in um, in City Hall in London before becoming the MP for Croydon North in London. You know, I don't think the bloke even wear, owns a pair of wellies. So they've made him, you know, they made him the Secretary of State for DEFRA. I, he may not be after the election. It may be somebody else. And that's the people we need to be talking to and lobbying after the election. There's no okay. point in writing now. Interesting. I guess... The positive to this is that there is no onus for these people. There's no legal responsibility for them to fulfill the things that they have said they will do in their manifesto, correct? So once they're in power, one could fight the case. Yeah, and, and, and we will. And basically, in, in Wales, they've banned snaring. The Labour government in Wales have banned snaring. And they, they, they absolutely refused to look at the science. Or, or, sorry, they did look at the science. They absolutely refused to acknowledge the science was right. Um, and they banned snaring because they thought it was the right thing to do, not because of what the science shows about protection of species and, and humanity of it, etc. It was the politically <clears throat> one correct of the, choice. Yeah, politically motivated choice, I think, when you look at, look at politics in Wales, when we're talking about rural issues. There seems to be a genuine war, war in Wales against rural Wales. And I'm not talking about shooting specifically, but farming is is genuinely under fire in wales and um, conservation is genuinely under fire and subsidies are not happening and there, there's so much going on from the labor government in wales and people are looking over the border from england and thinking gosh what's going to happen if we if we end up with a similar scenario here now there is one big difference between a parliament we have and an wales. upper house we have an upper house there are checks and measures and i don't think the Labour, the National Labour Party are quite as nationalist and left wing as the regional Welsh Labour Party. I think it is a different group of people who are much more grown up politicians. Um, well, they're, they're having to fight a harder fight, right, because they have an upper house and because we are a significantly bigger country with a much stronger opposition party. Yeah, well, that's the other key with Wales is that the, there is virtually no opposition. So, so. In, in England and nationally, it's a diff it is a different story. But I, I, I think some of the keys with, with snaring, for example, is we've got we've got some really good scientific evidence that we can present to the new government or the existing government if the Conservatives get back in or whoever it happens to be coalition. So we've got good scientific evidence we can present to them. We've got a a really good humane device in in the new cable restraint, humane cable restraint that's been in use for some years now. Um, and tried and tested, like it's yeah, technically absolutely. perfect for the job it's designed proven. for. Yes, across absolutely. the world, and it, and it's and it's yeah, and it's used by scientists to to, to radio tag tag foxes and let them go so they can get to you. So the device actually, if you can use it to capture, hold, radio tag, and then let go a healthy animal, you know the device is safe. The other thing we do need as a sector is more practitioner evidence. So we need more people who use these devices to let us know how they use them and why they use them and when they use them. And then we've got the scientific evidence and then the practitioner evidence and the two go together. They knit together and that's really, really important. So very soon there'll be a survey coming out from the NGO, um, which is in conjunction with the GWCT to, to all our keeper members and hopefully some farmers as well, asking those questions. You know, how do you use the device? When do you use these devices? Um, why do you use these devices and why can't you use other methods? So that, that, that evidence will be, practitioner evidence will be part of the campaign to maintain this really important conservation tool. I mean, this is kind of the hard work you guys do. I remember when they called a general election, we had a phone call shortly after about something else and I made a joke about how hard your job's going to be over the next couple of years. In reality, is not that you don't do anything at the moment, but it's just going to make your life hell just making sure and safeguarding shooting with a whole new group of potential leaders yeah and that that's that's really difficult a really good point right we're a smallish sector economically we're not but in terms of we're a smallish sector so so we want to get in front of the sector of state right? we want to go and speak to that that politician we want we want to we want to eyeball them give them our view and but so do the farmers 
so do the rewilders so do the birders so do the canoeists so you know and there's so going to the be conservation thousands charities, of people so lobbying. everybody absolutely so there's thousands of people are going to be lobbying and and it takes time to build these relationships so it's not something that happens in the first couple of weeks of parliament the, 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 this is a slow burn and it's why when you you know often i'll be talking to people and they say why don't you just go and see that politician well that's not that easy but i'll tell you what is easier you could go and see that politician john okay well so as a private citizen you can go out a lot easier and see your politician than you can as an agendered organization yeah absolutely so as a only in your constituency but within your constituency okay. you you can write to your politician or go and see them at a surgery and talk to them about your personal issues you voted for them they work for you they don't work for the party they're all independent businesses effectively they work for you so so if enough people in a constituency will go and see politician a with a similar problem you would expect politician a to bring that to the senior minister and johnny carter can ask his politician to bring a thing to a senior minister and say look i suggest you go and speak to the ngo about this then the secretary of state might come and reach out to us might not but might do if the right questions are asked and it's a project we've started in in wales the ngo started in wales we set up um uh, lobby groups in Wales very very recently but but this this is quite an interesting well I think it's interesting people might not but it's quite an interesting way of combating an issue or various issues at a local level to create a, a national response so um, I can talk about the makeup of the group and how they work and they're going to be rolled out into England as well eventually but but it, it's basically citizen activism citizen lobbying at the ground root grassroots level up to the local mp who will then feed that up to parliament which is no different to what a lot of people do to get their cases heard right it's actually motivating us end users who are part of a constituency of somebody vaguely important to go and make our issues known as opposed to sitting quietly grumbling that the world's unfair yeah. So remember when the first letters came out where you could put your postcode and name in it, it auto generated a, a letter that you could then send to e email or letter you could then send to your mm -hmm. MP or AM in Wales. So that was pretty revolutionary when that came out. When you now send an, a, an email to an MP, generally you'll get an automated response saying, thank you very much for your email. I get thousands of these every day. I will respond to all my constituencies emails unless it is an auto-generated mass email then i won't respond individually okay, so, so the value route, of those is now zero or do they count statistically dim, they still count statistically but it's diminishing because if if mpa gets 100 of those all the same it's only going to count them as one create one response now okay. think about think about it the other way so this is what got the ngo thinking about this okay so we've got a membership of 13 15 000, whatever it is spread logistically across the country Okay, across more urban parts of the country, we're, we're weaker in cities. Now, if in each constituency there are 12 people that are prepared to put their hand up and say, I'm going to get, I'll, I'll do something, I'll write an individual letter to my MP about a topic that I care about. So let's, let's say snaring, for instance, or trophy hunting, too, we've spoken about. So, so we've set up a group in a couple of groups in Wales, there's one in Shropshire running as well, um, where the, we held a meeting people joined the group members of any shooting organization joined the group it doesn't matter we're not partisan it's not branded ngo it's all done through whatsapp one of them wants to write to their am so assembly member in wales and write to their am about the banning of snaring or the licensing of game bird release or trophy hunting whatever it may be so they say on the group i want to write a letter i am Gwyn jones i'm a butcher i'm a welsh language speaker and this is the problem i've got right so the NGO will guide them in how to write an individual letter to that AM. It's not Free. a self-generated one. We, we, we brief them on how to do it. Free of charge. What then tends to... Yeah, yeah, completely free of charge. And they don't have to be a member. What then tends to happen is three other guys or girls on the group will say, I'm also in Cardigan, wherever it happened, wherever. Um, and I will write to my AM as well about the same topic. So you've then got four totally individual letters to an AM about a single topic. That's quite a lot. And then another one might say, well, I'll go and see them. 
So the NGO will find out when, they, when the, that AM is holding a surgery, book a slot for this person, brief them, and they can physically go and see the AM and talk to them about this issue. Then all of a sudden, you've got a backbench MP AM in this case, who's got five or six people in their constituency genuinely concerned about this single topic. They'll start taking notice and they might ask a question in Parliament for you. And that's how you can open doors from the bottom up. So, so we'll be lobbying from the top down in the traditional way. But we want to generate more people lobbying from the bottom up. And I think that's a really exciting way of doing it. And proper people power. Yeah, I mean, that is the uh, that that's democracy, right? That we're supposed to actually have a voice for ourselves. I guess most people just don't really know how to. I wouldn't know how to get about contacting my MP other than to Google it and hope there was an email address and hope they replied. But actually arming us as a community to fight our case for ourselves is great and educating us how to do it and i appreciate that thank you tim and the ngo yeah well no it, i mean it's 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 a good thing it's you could sort of compare it to, to the ukraine russian war couldn't you so so i mean you're going russia to so let's go for it <laughs> I, I i no, i'm gonna go down this rocky route i do come up weird stuff but so basically russia invaded the crimea invaded ukraine the Ukrainian army were all in the north um, northwest of the country, out the way. Uh, so they had to get them across this vast country. Really difficult thing to do. So what did the Ukrainians do? They didn't think, oh, what we've got to do is we'll just wait, let them loose some territory, let them go in. They basically opened the doors to the armory and said to the Ukrainians, help yourself and dig a trench until the army get here. <clears throat> and I think that's a similar mentality going forward we might have to have. It might have to be that the people who are involved in our community community might have to help themselves to the armory with some help with some guidance start defending whilst we can come in with a with a flanking maneuver to the top ministers and then you've got the top minister listening the backbenchers listening and all of a sudden you've got a groundswell of people who have at least heard your case and then if you don't like the answer you can vote them out in five years time and that's what they're scared about. As you said, if they get four emails about something, given that I guess certainly it's not a particularly British thing to get up in arms and actually contact your MP about anything, I would presume that they will start to think that that is popular opinion, right? Same as anything. Power of suggestion might actually help us out as opposed to just sitting quietly in the corner, which isn't an option as far as I see at this point in our down the road of shooting. No, we, we've, lob we've been lobbying for ever since WADB, British Field Sports Society, were in existence. We've been lobbying. The tactics haven't changed that, that dr dramatically over the, over the last 30, 40 years. So I think, uh, uh, you know, a, a campaign like this or, or a project like this is a, is a complete change of tactics for us as a community. Other, other people use it. For us, it's a complete change of tactics. And it's going to take some time to get people used to used to doing it. But the, the groups we set up in Wales have really got some really good momentum going and they're doing some really good work as as citizens. And as the groups evolved and grown from the 14 people who were initially on it to nearly 70 now, I think it is in this one specific one in South Wales, they're helping each other out. And one of them saying, oh, I actually did write to that MP and here's the response. And they're posting the response of that AM, sorry, on, on the WhatsApp group. So everyone can see what the AM said. And I, I met a local candidate today for the parliamentary election. And this is what that candidate from this party said about um, rural crime, for example. So so the the groups are sort of growing organically and they're doing some really good work. So And I, and I think as a as as a model... This can be expanded across the UK to to help get the right message out to the right people and help the shooting organisations have an o a door opened to lobby from the top down as well. Uh, and I think it's quite an exciting prospect. I, I wish it was one we didn't have to do, but I think it is quite an exciting prospect. Going back to political agendas of the Labour Party, I mean, presumably... We'll take a quick break, actually, from that. Presumably, Conservatives aren't looking to do anything fundamentally bad towards shooting and conservation. Right? Not that's in the not that's in their manifesto that I've seen. Okay. But we we we've also got to remember that under the the last Conservative government, we've had more restrictions placed on us than the previous Labour government, for example. So, not everything's rosy in the garden. We we've got to. We've got to adapt as a sector. We've got to 
be more i think we've got to be more open as a sector we've we've got to mm -hmm. show the good things we do but not in a not in a sort of we're better than you way just in a in, in a in a measured um in a measured scientific way that shows the absolute benefits of shooting and in a citizen way so um some of the moorland groups do some fantastic fantastic stuff on social media showing uh, rare species nesting successfully and fledging and uh, birds of prey thriving on grouse moors that's not of interest to 90 percent of the population but it's really good evidence to show the benefits of having full-time keepers and game management activities yeah, on a and landscape. all that evidence is in one place very easy for somebody to share show go and grab how many times have you been in a conversation and be like i can you find evidence you go yeah let me just google it as opposed to there just being well like, if you would like to show i'd like to show someone some pictures of birds on our moorland there's a whole facebook page group that you can go and do that with and yeah so on and so forth and perhaps some more of that wouldn't be a bad thing just central hubs of information or what did you call it citizen evidence citizen evidence citizen science isn't it i, I, I mean science, but yeah. we can all do it and we all rely on other people to do it i find that correct so i'll give you a good example this is something i actually did I was um, leaving my house. So I live in a small village in Wiltshire, but I live in the 10%, right? I live in the cheap houses that were built in the 70s in the corner of the village. As I was leaving the house, uh, I watched a magpie just hopping along a, a Leylandi hedge and it was acting like a hunting magpie do. You, we know what they look like and what they act like. Mm -hmm. So I got my phone out to start to record it. Magpie hopped into the hedge, pulled out a blackbird fledgling, flew onto my neighbor's roof and ate the fledgling and i managed to film the whole thing and i put it on my facebook my private facebook account and said here you go here's a magpie eating of here's his actual video evidence of them doing it now why is that important well because in again in wales magpies have been removed from the general license because natural resources wales said there's no evidence that magpies destroy wild bird populations now as country people we've probably seen that scenario play out that i filmed Ten, hundred, thousand times over your life, right? Mm -hmm. But none of us have bothered filming it. We've all got the ability to do it. Now, we all know it happens and we've all seen it. Now, that one 12, 15 second film can can be used as evidence that these things do it. Now, if we, we extrapolate that and exaggerate that by 100,000 shotgun certificate holders, all of a sudden we've got mm -hmm. a massive amount of citizen science. That, I mean, it does make a big difference, right? Because when they say there's no evidence, you can go, oh, I've got... 1200 videos of it happening right here from this year alone that's been powerful stuff by any standards yeah and really important johnny and i'll give you another example why because if you this year applied for a license to control magpies in wales so for example for the protection of livestock during lambing um i don't know of a single license that was successful that i know of wow. quite a lot that were unsuccessful because the license wasn't accompanied by any evidence Right, so photographic or video evidence. Now, that's really tricky when the license requirements only changed this year, this January. Yeah, because why would so you have last year it there was no because it was you could have done something about it. Yeah, absolutely. So last year you didn't need to have evidence. So they said, but don't worry, you can apply for a license. So people have applied for a license, but there's no evidence. So they're gathering evidence this year, taking the financial hit on the lands and apply for a license next year with the evidence and we'll see where we go from there but that's why that's why licensing is tricky as well because licenses can be changed adapted and misinterpreted at any point so 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 this evidence to have it ready is really important when we when we're talking about snaring and like i said earlier on the you know, survey is going to come out and we we could also do with some photographic evidence of good use so there's 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 lots of there's lots of things everyone who's involved in game management can help us and i mean us collectively as in the shooting organizations the members of aim to sustain whatever to have the ammunition to be able to lobby properly and you do the same at your end firearms licensing is obviously uh, kind of fundamental to shooting i saw was it in the labor manifesto saying that they are gonna do full cost recovery on firearms licensing and then use that money for um, victim support and rehabilitation of uh, knife and gun crime. Is that right? Or is I, I'm misremembering? 
No, you're remembering right. It's one that wasn't in there initially that only popped up this weekend. So only popped up um, three days ago. Uh, and it's it, that's really interesting in on so many levels. And, and one of the ways is interesting is because you're taking a legally held firearm or, a, you know, a legally held firearm certificate or shotgun certificate that someone's taken the bother to apply for and spent the money on the application and the doctor's note and all the things, the ancillaries that go around with it. And then the government are linking that to gun crime and knife crime, which has got absolutely nothing to do with legally held firearms. And I think that's quite a quite an interesting step mentally for the government to link the two anyway. You know, why aren't they using tax from uh, people who caused accidents in their car to do to do a similar thing why is it somebody who's or someone going for a diver's license you know i yeah, i, I can't they, understand because the they buy a knife two. right potentially i find it a really difficult but it's, it's an extremely interesting thing as well because somewhere along the line somebody has sat there and gone this makes sense to me and i i mean i guess a lot of it is to do with uh, the infection of american gun cultural or into social media in england that somebody sitting there doing policy who has probably has zero concept of firearms licensing and legal gun ownership in the uk or probably has a very limited understanding has gone yes this makes sense because that might make sense from my understanding of american gun culture and that's the only link i could find that made sense there is that if they thought that legally fell held firearms were for anything other than what they are i mean that's a, that's the only sense i'm trying to make sense of it maybe i'm just stretching too far but it felt like a really bizarre move and one I'm not particularly behind. I mean, if they did full cost recovery on firearms licensing, maybe they could use that to provide a really good and proficient firearms licensing system. That was the sales pitch, right? So so, so the sales pitch for total cost recovery was you're paying for a service, you're going to get it. So yeah. no, no one minds. You, you wouldn't mind. You wouldn't mind spending, I think it works £100 out a year for a firearms license? 58. Seems fair. Yeah, exactly. Not a lot of money, right? So it's, so it, it's enough, it, but it's that, not enough to, to stop me owning a gun. Yeah. That to me seems perfectly legitimate, but then if they're going to use it as a taxation to pay for something completely different, I just find it bizarre. And actually, when you drill into the figures, it's not going to produce a huge amount of income for victim support. We're, we're talking of a couple of million. Yeah, quid. the sub. The, this is it. The subsidies that are used to pay for farms licensing are not big figures in the grand scheme of government money. It's enough to change your life, but it's not changing your life. It's yeah. going to be lost in bureaucracy for just even probably setting up this program, let alone even getting it started. Yeah. And 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 actually, the, the cost of firearms licensing is driven by the inefficiency of the process. So the better it gets, the cheaper the process should be. So if we've got total cost recovery, it should be more efficient. Therefore, the cost should reduce. But if they're taxing us then there's there's absolutely no way we, we could ever reduce the cost or become more efficient at it. So, I mean, I mean some of the figures we're looking at, um, they're looking at about 180 to 250 pounds for every five years for total cost recovery, depending where, where they That's decide. That's not as bad as I would have thought, you know. But it, as you said, when you actually times that by the amount of firearms licensing holders, it's not, I mean, it's, it's a large amount of money, but... If they're then not going to use that to fix the system, if they're still going to provide the same service, and then I don't, I just really struggle to get my head around it because I don't think anybody who owns a gun would mind paying a bit more if the service was legitimately brilliant. And it's not bad, bad, but it's not good, good. And again, yeah. it really depends and where you depends... are in the country as to what your experience is with this. That's what I was going to say. But, but also, Johnny, if... So total cost recovery is that. So you recover the total cost of the firearms license, the total cost. And so that's what it costs. If you're then going to take that money and use it to yeah. fund another project, it's yeah, the not deficit being used. to the government remains the same. Yeah. It remains the same or greater. Yeah. Because you're taking yeah, yeah. the money away. So it's, it, 
it, it, it's another one of these sort of weird vote grabbing things that no one's thought through because we because you yeah, know, finding two million pounds or three or four million pounds for the government would be significantly easier than just doing that right how many firearms licenses are there in the uk or shotgun licenses so just over half a million so yeah. yeah so so let's say it would be 60 odd million if they did it total cost recovery right let's just say i'm picking figures out it'd be slightly less than that i think on the figures and by the time you've taken out the current budgets and the wages of the feos firearms inquiry officers so on and so forth it won't leave a lot of money for this victim support thing so they're either going to have to withdraw the, more money from firearms licensing therefore we're in exactly the same boat or it's or it's a purely a soundbite and a, and a way of taxing people going about their legal their legal i mean it, because we've got you've got a firearm certificate and shotgun certificate i've got a firearm shotgun certificate we're going to be taxed to pay for um Criminals. a victim of a yeah of a victim of a criminal from i don't know manchester london walthamstow where, yeah. whatever who bought a gun who's been illegally stabbed. or got stabbed which is an illegal activity yeah. with a legal thing i just i really struggled to get my head around their logic and i i am not against the when I felt so obviously everyone shared that screenshot of the page and I'm reading through it, I'm going, This doesn't seem like necessarily a bad thing until you go to the last sentence and this will be paid for by full cost recovery and farms licensing. And yeah, I mean sixty million quid's a lot of money, but it's also, as we said, if you you could find it in probably better ways and I'd rather, to be fair, pay a full cost recovery on farms licensing and have a unbelievably good digitalized modern farms licensing system. But hey, that's um, that's enough on that one. I don't think that's a... Maybe it is a vote winner. Maybe... I, I really don't understand. I think for what it was, it was a vote loser for literally plenty of people who shoot and potentially aren't into the more Tory parts of shooting. I think that is a big yeah. turn off. But half a million people... Is half a million people enough to sway an election? No. Probably not. Maybe. No. So if if almost all the rural voters voted for one party... And I think it's something like a third of city dwellers voted for another party. So 100% of rural voters vote one way, third of city dwellers vote the other way. The other side would win a landslide. It's it, with The rural vote is relatively insignificant. 80% of the population live in cities in England. Not ideal, eh? Uh, right to Rome is the next one on the agenda. This is a really tricky one for a very populated small landmass, i.e. England. The details they're quite sketchy on on this one, and I think the Liberals are doing something similar on on right to Rome, but effectively they want to make rivers navigable rivers uh, and woodlands or woodlands uh, open access. I mean that's mad. Is that mad? I don't I, see. I I appreciate the concept of right to Rome. I really do, and I think for the most part, most people would treat some people would treat that with respect. But you can only do something like that if you then empower the landowners to punish those who disrespect their property, for it is still their property, right? Um, I think from a river's yeah, perspective, so, I think if, yeah, wow. Yes, so, so no, it, it's a really difficult one. Do we want to restrict public access? So, so, or do we want to let the public everywhere? And it's if, it's a really hard one. I think people look at somewhere like Sweden with all man's red done where people do have a good relationship with nature and there is then a mutual respect for each other's nature. So people do generally have a culture of looking after the nature they've got full open access to. But that doesn't exist in England at all. Uh, and I, don't, I, no, I be, remember reading their manifesto, it does... says it's about fostering a better relationship with wildlife, but that doesn't start by going, here you go, you people yeah. need to be so taught that, say, given that. Playing, playing devil's advocate, you could say, how are you going to foster a relationship with wildlife if you're not allowed to go out and look at wildlife? Um, but there's still in reality there's so. i was going to say in reality there's plenty of places we've got the forestry england estate where people can go and walk and um free of charge there's huge tracts of the south downs um the chases all these areas have got right to roam on them already so it'll be opening up woodlands now we got woodlands which are quite sensitive we've got drier summers hotter summers so we've got fire risk uh we've got risk to wildlife and then we've got other government initiatives that are would fall outside of that and, and be opposed to that. So I've 
I've seen a draft of the England deer strategy that the Forestry Commission are writing. And within that, they talk about needing more people out culling more deer to reduce deer populations, to re reduce damage to, to woodland, expand the woodland network, which will create more harborage for deer. And they, they state that one of the limiting factors to culling deer in many places is is a high amount of public access because it's... Yeah, it I mean, we can unsafe. both attest to that having shot deer in woods where there's lots of people. It makes it hard, it makes the deer yeah. skittish and it often just ruins an hour's work getting into some fallow or something, right? I think yeah. even just so, like from a fragility of wildlife perspective, there's got to be some quiet and sacred places. Imagine it's your woods. That's all, how we always look at right to roam, right? Imagine that's your woods. I don't want someone in my woods. Land's really expensive. This isn't like America where land is relatively affordable. Land's expensive. If you've paid, what, £30,000 an acre for some woods why why shouldn't you be able to enjoy that by yourself and I, I appreciate it's not fair that i can't afford those woods but there is plenty of woods i can enjoy i, I find it very hard to understand the right to roam concept as a blanket rule i agree i agree with you entirely there and i think the other thing we forget is right to roam generally doesn't just mean the person and the backpack and the cagoule and the os map it also means the two dogs it's the, and the dogs um, as we've established in previous videos is they are well, they're the biggest predator we've got physically. Yeah, other than us. Yeah, well, um, we don't go around uh, smashing and the other thing I was... nests and doing whatever we want, right? But generally speaking, the guy in his cagoule with a map is pretty respectful. He'll yes. walk on the park. Yeah, absolutely. He... And even if he didn't, yeah. he's not going to cause that much damage. The two dogs will. And all but you also have to do is look at up... dog ownership and dog walkers to sort of get an idea of that already lack of respect for nature and the land or lack of understanding maybe more than lack of yeah respect. i think there's a, and the, there's also the the unintended consequences johnny so so he, you know a woodland near me very well and i was saying to you as we were coming in here today that we we found um so there's there's public access in this private woodland large private woodland around five thousand acres where i live and um the family allow the public to walk around it and this weekend, one of, one of the deer stalkers found two crossbow bolts, new crossbow bolts. So you don't know who's going into the wood. And you don't know who's going in there for what reason. Now, they could have been shooting at trees with these crossbows, but these were right in the woods. Once you start to open it up, you open up the undesired consequences of things like poaching, coursing, wild camping, wildfires, etc., etc. And those un, unthought of consequences... Are, are, are not a problem until they're a massive problem and then the resources that government have to put in to fix those problems they've created by a vote winning piece of legislation probably far outweighs the benefit of what they were doing in the first place i think on the face of it i am not against people getting out there and enjoying nature but as we've said with things like reintroductions in the past there has to be a plan for the future of this if you look at for example the success we've seen with birds of prey and then what happens when there's too many? What, what what happens when this plan goes really successfully and there's people everywhere and there's no wildlife and that's that's the thing? What happens when people abuse this rule? Are you going to empower the police? Are you going to fund looking after these places and actually monitoring them and helping people foster that relationship with nature, which I think is a great thing? Yeah, I, I, I see better ways of doing it, potentially. Not like you could ask me what they are right now. What are they, Johnny? I tell you what, I'll fix. I'll give me, give me a couple of beers, and then I'll fix the world. I'll put it to rights. <laughs> That's the best. Way Tim, to do. I, I think we need to do a round two of this again. I don't think there's any particular solutions to who to vote for or anything like that. But uh, giving people an understanding of what the outcomes might be if some of these things go to pass will, well, is fascinating to me and hopefully helpful to others. I think we've got to take a a, a deep dive and. Um, maybe i tell you it would be quite interesting actually if we get someone from without to talk about some of these some of these topics someone who is outside of our sphere i'd be down for debates on each of these subjects I think that might be quite entertaining um leading up to the election if we can get a few people on who perhaps are pro right to roam and are pro full cost recovery for gun crime in fact would i doubt it's possible but it would be very interesting if we can get whoever came up with that concept or somebody who is at least from that party to come and justify it we, we could try we could try that but whilst they're on the campaign trail it's really difficult to get to anything other than campaign but it could be it could be part of a campaign for them couldn't it yeah we would give them the airtime <laughs> to an audience that really doesn't appreciate their opinion 
but I guess the whole point is, shouldn't they be there to justify their their existence to those who don't want to vote for them? Try and get that side. I don't know. That's not politics, is it? Well, it is. But I think I think whatever happens when we get a new government, I think that there will be. We've got to not go into it too too negatively, John. We've got we've got to think about the next steps. We 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 can't just dis- declare a disaster a national disaster for rural britain yeah, yeah. what we've got to do is we've, we we've got to be positive we've got to mobilize we've got to get together we've got to be team rural right so it doesn't matter yeah, which side of the coin you're on yeah. do what we can now and that but also plan for the future of either outcome so that we're not left there with egg on our face and we do have a plan for the future of what we do regardless of which political parties in play because it shouldn't matter which political parties in play it yeah, should I, matter I, I that we defend what we want for the future for our future, for our kids' future, and for the future of wildlife. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and show that it matters to a large percentage of the rural population, the urban population. You know, what what people do, and we, we've talked about it in another podcast, you know, I've got the theory that every minute you spend with a gun or fishing rod doesn't come off your lifetime. Now, that those are really important things, time spent with family, time spent in the wild, time spent with nature. is really, really, really important. And that's the message we we collectively need to get across. And it is collectively. I work for the NGO. We're doing our bit. Basque are doing their bit. Countryside Alliance are. Everybody is working really hard. You you pay your subscriptions to whichever one you want to be, but it doesn't mean as an individual you can't make an impact yourself. And sometimes those individuals who step up to the plate are the most impactful of all of them. Nice to see you, Johnny. Take care.